be here to uh, introduce George Powell's and Byron Maskin's The War of the Worlds, and I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Virginia Film Festival. Um, I really don't know where to begin with this film. I, I don't think I can begin to put across how much effort and how much hellish trouble they went through making this in five minutes, but I'll try. Um, it's, uh, since this film deals with kind of miraculous subject matter, it's appropriate that it's getting produced in the first place was kind of a miracle. Um, other filmmakers had tried before Alan Haskin, uh, Sergei Eisenstein, the great Russian filmmaker, had tried to make it in the 20s. Hitchcock had been interested in it briefly, supposedly. Um, Jesse Lasky had tried, and I believe Cecil B. DeMille had too, uh, whose home studio was Paramount, where this was eventually made. Um, Powell first got a hold of it when he came to Paramount about 1951. To give you some background, how many people out there know who George Powell was? Oh, there's a few. Okay, good. Um, he was basically the father of the American science fiction film um, at a time when science fiction films were basically considered sort of kiddie matinee trash. You know, it's like Flash Gordon's rocket ship with a sparkler behind it or something. He made films with really tremendous integrity and aimed at a much higher intellectual caliber of his audiences. And uh, his films won Oscar after Oscar, usually for special effects, which was unheard of. Uh, he had tremendous difficulty getting them made because, um, as a friend of mine put it, he didn't he made his movies in spite of the studios, not with them, basically. They didn't really understand science fiction. It was not an established cinematic form. Um, and he really took all the lumps that allowed people like George Lucas and Steven Spielberg to make films. Um, the, um, uh, before this, he had made Destination Moon in 1950, which is his first major hit feature film, uh, which had sparked the science fiction film boom of the 1950s. It was in color, which was really unheard of for science fiction film at the time. It's based on a Robert Heinlein novel and was done with a tremendous amount of care and research. And it was a huge box office hit, and um, it proved that science fiction could be bankable and it could be intelligent and all sorts of things. Um, he had followed that up with When Worlds Collide for Paramount, which had also been a big hit and won an Oscar. Um, to direct this film, uh, since he was just producing, he chose Byron Haskin, uh, who was kind of, and I don't mean to be really insulting him, since he was kind of a talented studio hack director. Um, his biggest films were probably the Treasure Island movies for Disney and some very good films noir like uh, I Walk Alone with Kirk Douglas. I, I think, I, I'm not exaggerating when I say that War of the Worlds is probably his masterpiece. Um, you, you can tell in virtually every frame of the film that he really deeply cared about what he was doing, he was completely engaged in it. Um, more importantly, though, Haskin had been the head of the special effects department at Warner Brothers in the 30s, and uh, that was, he was absolutely perfect in that sense to helm this special effects laden film. Um, one of the most important people who was involved in this film was uh, the art director, uh, Albert Nozaki, who his other credits included Shane, uh, The Ten Commandments, things like that. Um, he was a really brilliant man, and he designed probably the central the focal point of this film, which are the beautiful Martian war machines. They were never called the Martian warships or the Martian vaporizers or whatever. They were just always the Martian war machines for some reason. Um, they settle on that design after all sorts of ulcerating problems and you know, aborted designs. Um, they drop the idea of having, of course, in the H.G. Wells novel, they have these tripod walking machines, um, which they drop because presented so many technical difficulties. How does a tripod walk? Does it walk like a man on crutches? Does it walk one leg at a time? And also, how would they have it walk over like destroyed city models and things like that and gullies? Um, so one day, um, Nozaki, while telling the story, he was just sitting in his living room one day, and the word manta just magically popped into his head. And so he used that as the basis for the design. It's, it's I have to say, they're probably the most aesthetically pleasing instruments of war ever designed. Um, he also incorporated elements of, there's a kind of cobra head ray projector on top, and they move like swans. So in that way, they kind of prefigure, say, like the biomechanical designs of a painter like H.R. Geeker. Um, also, uh, Chesley Bonestell uh, contributed to this film uh, really heavily. He did the beautiful paintings of the planets and the, this opening montage of the tour of the planets. Um, Bonestell was probably the most important astronomical artist of the 20th century, and he contributed matte paintings to films like Citizen Kane and Magnificent Andersons. Um, there's, um, I'm going to warn you right off the bat, 
um, you can see the wires that are holding up the war machines. And this is not the filmmaker's fault. Um, what happened was, this one was originally shot in three-strip Technicolor, um, which involved this massive camera with three, three rolls of film going at once, and it produced this incredibly rich, really beautiful, saturated color palette. And um, it, fell out of, it fell into disuse because it was so expensive in the 60s and 70s. So in, in the original prints, they were so saturated, you couldn't see the wires. Um, but as, um, as they started striking color reversal interpositive prints in the early 70s, all of a sudden the wires start jumping right out at you. So the, the filmmakers weren't total jackasses, you know, it was, it was just, this happened later. Um, there's, a, um, there's a real element of religion, this, this real current of religion that runs through religiosity, that runs through George Powell's films, um, and it, it's confused a lot of people because a lot of people said, oh, he was a deeply religious man, just based on his movies, he really wasn't. Um, his son once told me that it's Powell's idea of religion was to send his sons to church on a Sunday and stay home and watch a football game. Um, and he really, he, but he said he basically kept it as kind of a commercial consideration. But in this film, the, the religious element works beautifully. It fits perfectly into it. And it also gives this sort of through line that builds up to the climax. Um, I think that the Steven Spielberg remake was a good film. Um, but there were a couple of mistakes that he made that Powell hadn't. One was he showed the Martians too much. You only see one Martian in this film for virtually a split second, very, very briefly. Um, the Martian, by the way, was played by an actor named Charlie Gamora, and he was lovingly nicknamed Louis Lump Lump by the crew. Um, it's a very interesting looking little mushroom kind of creature. Um, but also the, the, the problem in Spielberg's version, it just sort of ends. But in this film, there's, a sort of, there's this very gradual, this buildup of sort of religious iconography and religious characters and things like that. And the end, the end is all very, very religious. And also, the, the religious element makes perfect sense with this film because um, in times of warfare and times of disaster, people turn en masse to religion. And as you'll see at the end of the film, it just it makes absolutely perfect sense. And uh, there are no atheists and fossils in this particular war. Um, I'd also like to put a couple of other things before I uh, sign off here. Um, the opening, most of the people in this cast will probably recognize, just, they're very recognizable character actors, no real name actors here. Um, but uh, the opening narration was performed by a voice actor named Paul Fries, who you'll also see in the film as a radio reporter. Um, there's also a radio reporter at the I digress here, uh, radio reporter at the scene of the first Martian crash site. That's kind of a reference to the Force of broadcast. Um, but Paul Fries um, is known to anybody that's ever cut on the TV in the last 50 years. He was the Pillsbury Doughboy, he was Boris Badenoff and Rocky and Bullwinkle, he was in virtually all of George Powell's films. Um, so you finally get to see the guy's face. Um, the, uh, the sound effects in this film are immediately recognizable. They've been reused in dozens and dozens of science fiction films. Actually, they just used them this year in Starship Troopers 3 and Wally. -E. Um, the, um, it's interesting, this film was shot on stage 18 at Paramount. It was Paramount's biggest stage, mostly shot there. And that's actually the stage that Norma Desmond visits in Billy Wilder's uh, Sunset Boulevard. Um, now, um, I think that that's about all. Um, but I, 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 would, I just advise you to pay, pay really close attention to the, the visual style of this film. It's really extraordinary. It's, it's way ahead of its time. The editing is really beautiful, very fluid, very elegant. And there are so many different shots. The, the variety of shots in this film is just incredible. Um, I will warn you, this print has gone, I, I'm told, kind of red. So um, I apologize in advance for that. Um, but uh, I hope that you enjoy it. It's, it's a really amazing film. And um, if anybody has any questions or would like to talk to me about or whatever afterwards, just tap me on the shoulder. And um, I would like to wish you a very happy Halloween and a, lo and a lovely Dia de Muertos. And um, enjoy the show.